Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Modishead. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Legal Innovation at the College of Law. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our guest today and to welcome you back to the Reinvented Legal Business, the Case Study Series. As you know, this series is all about showcasing thought leaders and doers, um, people that are doing legal practice differently. And our guest today is, is absolutely an example of that. So, Marguerite, Delighted to have you here. Hi. Hi, and thank you. So Marguerite's going to take us through um, a couple of businesses that she's established, founded, uh, Melker and Smart Separation. Take us through what they are, why she did it. And I'm just going to say, Marguerite, you know, I have always recognised you as one of the folks that that were re that were really doing legal business differently, legal legal practice differently, well ahead of the game. So just so delighted to welcome you here today. Thanks for that, Cherry. Thank you, and I am delighted to be here. So the first thing to say about what I am doing is to explain that. The two businesses that I have are one is a legal practice, which is Smart Separation, and the second one is MELCA, and that's an acronym for Melbourne Collaborative Alliance. And that is a business that runs collaborative cases, but is not actually a legal practice in itself. So when we established MELCA in 2009, I was a conventional practitioner in a conventional legal firm. And I had the good fortune already to have met Dr. Tina Sinclair, who is a psychologist and collaborative trainer, and Tricia Peters, who's a financial planner. And we had a belief between us all that there had to be a better way of helping families to go through separation. We'd all encountered families in our different capacities as a psychologist, financial planner, and in my case, as a lawyer. So we got together and started chatting and had a dream that perhaps one day we'd form a collaborative center and Tricia and I were sitting at a forum in the US several years, I suppose, before we finally established Melka, saying how much we'd like to do that. And I imagined it was a five-year plan, and it turned out to be closer to only a two-year plan. I think a lot of people on this webinar are going to know what collaborative practice is, and that's not really the point of this webinar, and I don't want to be slavish about it. But for those who aren't familiar with the practice, it's a dispute resolution process. And one of the things I'd say about that is it's sometimes the providers of the service who get more caught up on the names of the services we're providing than the clients do. You could say it's mediation on steroids. But for me, what this is about is a team. At its minimum, when collaborative practice started many years ago, it was two lawyers and two clients signing themselves out of the adversarial and litigation process, doing that by signing an agreement without prejudice, the same as in mediation, and saying, let's brainstorm how we can achieve a settlement that works for all members of a family. And it soon became apparent to other than the lawyers or, or to the lawyers that they needed other practitioners in as well. So there was open legal information given in these meetings, but that didn't often really get at the heart of what people were there for. And it's been a mantra of ours since we started that separation is really a legal process last. It's more an emotional and financial crisis with some legal outcomes. And over the years, I guess, as a lawyer, I have reduced the number of importance on a scale of one to 10 where I think the law sits in any interpersonal dispute. We have done some cases in estates um, estates and wills disputes as well as in family law but I think that what we're really talking about is less about law and more about everything else these days and some of the Californians and those who took up interdisciplinary practice early on realized that the addition of a single psychologist as a neutral or two psychologists in a case and a financial planner was going to add value and one of the things that we realised when we started Melka was that it was going to be incredibly important that we worked in interdisciplinary collaboration because we were interdisciplinary. And we knew that there was a lot of work around forming teams. We knew that everybody had to have role clarity, that there had to be a great deal of trust around people's competence and integrity. 
And so we've always been really careful about putting our teams together. And that's one of the things that I will come to because it's a feature of how people work in collaborative practice and it causes a lot of issues around the world. And we have come up with a process for trying to get over the creation of teams. So what we're trying to do is form a support envelope for our clients so that they feel supported in terms of their emotional health and well-being and communication, their financial literacy, their psychology around money, as well as having some legal input. So when we went back to the start at Melga, we wanted to move right away from big law, or I especially wanted to move right away from big law, and that's what I had done um, in, in moving to Melka. And we understood that it's a legal process, there need to be lawyers involved, but Melka itself is not a law firm and was never designed that way. So we were trying to put ourselves in the shoes of clients who were going through separation so that the first time they encountered the idea behind what we were doing was that they would experience a sense of support for the things that were really burning for them. And we were thinking a lot about preemption and preparation for negotiations. And rather than just saying, get all of your legal documents and your finances in order, and then we'll come into a meeting, we decided that there had to be a completely different mindset around that, that we had to move right away from the risk of adversarial thinking and being truly client focused. We wanted an opportunity, not just for families to stay out of court, but to stay right away from adversarial thinking. And we knew that as soon as people were stuck in adversarial thinking, that was really going to poison the will of creative thinking. And it's one of the reasons we took big law out because big law stands for adversarial law. And we wanted to help people to understand that we were there thinking about what was going for them, going on for them psychologically amidst all the chaos of separation, the grief, the anger, and the other emotional experiences that people were going through. And we wanted to prepare people so that when they got to the point of negotiation, they had all of the support around them that they were going to need. We were very conscious that conflict is at the heart of most interpersonal dispute. And we are all trained in conflict management as most of the people who work in our cases are. And we were prepared to sit in that conflict to help people manage and understand their conflict, their own role in it, and the importance of the team as part of this system of conflict, what was going on in our own team, what were our own personal conflict styles, and what was, the, what was going on in the team system as well as what was going on in the family system. So we were doing a lot of work together as a team, preempting what might be going on amongst the team and looking at early intervention steps for the family as well. We wanted all of our communication with our clients to be really clear. We wanted it to be emphatically understood by them that they were at the heart of a human-centered design process, although, of course, that's not the language we were using and nor were they. But we wanted our communication to be clear, concise and continuous. We knew that we needed case management if that was going to happen, because as everybody who's watching this webinar knows, we're all busy in meetings, on a phone, creating documents, whatever it is that we're doing in our individual practice. And we wanted our clients to have immediate access to somebody who understood their story, their family, and knew and was part of the design of where they were in the process. So we created the role of a case manager for that point of contact for the listening ear so that clients were never failing to understand where they were in their process. If something happened, they could always get onto the phone um, and have somebody to speak to, and that would be our case manager. I'm going now to this little video animation, um, which kind of explains how we Divorce work. often turns into a messy court affair, creating unnecessary expense and emotional stress. At Melka, we keep couples out of court by working out a fair and peaceful property settlement and plan for their children's future. Here's an example of collaboration in action. Scott and Claire are splitting up. They've been married for 18 years, have a 16-year-old daughter, Stella, and a 14-year-old son, Matt. 
Scott owns a chain of restaurants and Claire works as a hairdresser. Each wants their assets to be divided fairly. Melka assigns a team of skilled collaborative lawyers, financial planner, family consultant and a child specialist for a peaceful ending to their marriage. The two collaborative lawyers help Scott and Claire with the settlement negotiations and legal paperwork. The family consultant helps with their communication and to deal with their emotions. A child specialist helps them to put their kids first in their parenting plan. They also meet a neutral financial planner who helps them collate all of their financial information in one place and create family budgets so their settlement will do what they both need. Everything has been going smoothly until Scott's accountant asked Claire to sign their yearly trust tax return. Claire refused. She believed Scott had been hiding money and became suspicious about all the assets. Scott was furious that she was being uncooperative. Melka helps Claire to understand that distributing family money via the trust was what they had always done to save tax and there were no secret assets. In a meeting with the family consultant, Claire apologised for having been quick to suspect Scott of being untrustworthy. Scott apologised for assuming that Claire was being deliberately uncooperative. He came to see that she was just really scared. This collaborative experience helped Scott and Claire learn some things about communication and conflict management. They avoided expensive arguments between lawyers and stayed out of court. And the fees that Melka saved them? That's for their new life and a better financial future. Melka, the complete personalised approach to separation without court. Okay, so that video is probably now a little bit dated, I, I reflect on as I look at it. Um, so our case manager is in charge of making sure that kind of client focus is maintained all along the way. And one of the ways that we do that, and what's really central, is the creation of teams. And people are often challenged by this. So around the world, you might have one client or the other in a dispute who decides that collaborative practice or mediation is the thing they're interested in. They go to see their individual lawyer and so does their spouse. And they might have completely different conversations in that legal office about the, the process options that they might be able to go through. If the practitioner is very adversarially focused, if they think litigation and adversarial negotiations or negotiations between lawyers are the way to go, that's the kind of conversation that will emerge first followed by probably mediation and less frequently collaboration. And as everybody knows, since the 1st of September last year, our clients are now required to sign a certificate of genuine effort about the efforts that they've made before issuing um, court proceedings. And it's of some level of concern for me that that doesn't include collaborative practice on the court website, but it also does include communication between lawyers without there being any testing of what that actually means, there's a vagueness about that kind of communication between lawyers and those negotiations. And we didn't want our clients to experience that. So our meetings happen with a team. So when we established Melka, the things that we were really concerned about was to see how are we going to assemble teams? How are we going to ensure that both clients have the choice to work in the same process? And so we came up with a process map um, or, or a process design, but we wanted that to be backed by certain things for our clients. We wanted them to know that they were stepping into a pro process where they had price certainty. So we started working in fixed pricing. And to be honest, when we first started that, it was very much a suck and see process. We did a few cases and we worked out um, what we thought about the pricing. We were really clear that we needed to have everybody on the team um, with the same training. We wanted our clients to know that they had full support legally, financially and emotionally. It was really important to us to make send a message to our practitioners and to our clients that every professional on that team was of equal importance and our practitioners have always been equally remunerated. And that came as something of a surprise to a lot of the lawyers, because in fact, it wasn't about bringing everybody else's fees up to the lawyer's fees. It was really about adjusting lawyer's fees downward. But the lawyers didn't need to do any marketing or admin in their cases because that was all being done by Milka. So we were in fact contracting in the professionals. And this was probably 
um, a step that I'd read about Richard Su from Richard Susskind many years before, um, didn't really understand how it would work and thought it was probably a bridge too far until we established Melka and realised that was probably the best way that we were going to be able to work. So going on now to our process map, clients see this information, it's given to them in various different forms and it's on the website. So the first thing that we did was to say to ourselves, well, how is it that we're going to get both parts of the couple or all or two of the people in dispute to come in and hear the information in the same place at the same time or now on Zoom? Because we weren't a law firm, we, I suppose, had a particular luxury that we didn't have any potential ethical complaints or conflict of interest complaints around seeing both halves of a couple or both clients. But nonetheless, I, as a legal practitioner, was often the person providing those information meetings. And in the early days, because there weren't many practitioners around, I was sometimes in the cases. So what we did was create an information meeting in which absolutely no legal advice is given to anybody. And I would say this is a meeting that can be conducted by any lawyer in their private firm anywhere, anytime. Our clients sign a disclaimer saying that they understand that they're not getting legal advice. They're getting some legal information that's in the common domain. But what we're doing is trying to understand from each client what it is that they're hoping to achieve at the end of their separation or at the end of the re resolution of whatever dispute they're in. And rather than talking to them about how lawyers might work or how the litigation process works, we're trying to understand where they want to end up and then speaking to them about the process options that are most likely to support what it is that they're trying to achieve. Now, because we run a collaborative centre, I must say I do make the assumption that people who come to see me aren't choosing to go to court, and occasionally that is necessary. They do have to go to court. But if that became obvious, that, that would be a referral out. But the information meeting is about saying, let's work out the process that's going to work for you. And if it is collaboration or mediation, the next step they're going to go through is what we call a discovery meeting. And this is where the clients meet the team. And this is where we have probably our greatest point of departure from other practices. Because we assemble the teams and contract the practitioners in, when our clients come in for their discovery meeting, they meet their team. And that team has formed and stormed and normed long before the, the meeting that our clients are arriving at at that day. All of the team members know what they're doing, what their role is, and are able to speak with their clients about the level of support, the nature of the support, what they're going to be doing for our client in the collaborative or mediation process. With the client's permission at the end of that meeting, what happens is that the professional team meets in a debrief. And way back in the beginning, we actually held that meeting to help us to scope the work. But it then became so valuable from the point of view of the team and from the point of view of our clients in determining what was going on, not just about the scope of work, that at times I almost forget that's the origin of that meeting, the, the post-discovery meeting debrief with the team, because we learn so much. Uh, as a legal practitioner, all of you would know, you know your own client, you know your client's story. Most of us these days are alert enough to know somewhere else there is a second or a third story. Some people think the third story is the story of the relationship, the dynamic. Not so sure I buy into that because I think there are there's more than one story of the relationship anyway. But when I go into one of these debrief meetings, I hear from the other legal practitioner, I hear from the psychologist, I hear from the financial planner what it was they learned from their clients. And this is openly communicated because our clients have given us permission to have that communication. Now, we haven't taken instructions. We haven't given legal advice. This is a what does this family or couple need meeting that we're having in discovery. And so we're at liberty to have that debrief meeting to help us understand what's going to go on for the family. And it's extraordinary how often I get really big surprises in this meeting. 
it helps me to build compassion for the whole family but the other spouse too because I get a much better understanding of what's going on behind the story that my client has told me about that spouse which is often a description of presenting behavior and it might also be a description of their interpretation of that behavior and then I have a neutral psychologist in the model we work in who gives me some kind of a working theory about what it is that might really be going on. At that point we might have a general discussion about whether it looks like a full collaborative team is going to be the best for this family or whether perhaps they might skinny down to a mediation. But we don't know that at that point. It's a, it's a working discussion. We then go on to the third step and our clients are made aware of that. If they opt in um, to do the third step, then that is goal setting work with all of the team members, all of whom are really coaching and supporting their clients, so the financial planner and the psychologist are neutral. Their meetings will always be um, or can be with both clients, whereas the lawyers will only ever meet with their clients individually and separately as is normal. But we'll have a picture of what's going on for the family, where their emotional readiness is, where everybody is on the separation spectrum and some broad idea of the financial picture by the time we've done the foundation work. So we would say about 60% of the work we either do with a couple or carry out in a dispute is going to have occurred before we ever sit down in a negotiation meeting. And again, that's an enormous point of departure um, for us, um, not only from conventional legal practice, but also in the world of collaborative and dispute resolution. So what we're trying to do there is to say we're going into a negotiation which is choreographed, which is planned, which has all of the inbuilt supports, but actually is able to then be quite a commercial and business-like meeting because we have everything we need. Our clients have everything we need that they need to go ahead into their negotiations. And if we decide and with, in consultation with the clients that the issues are small, sometimes they've resolved themselves in the foundation work and that a single facilitator mediator is going to be sufficient for the family, that might be the pathway they go down. But the truth of the matter is it's probably less than an 80-20. Most of our clients go on to a full collaborative process because of the value they've come to understand about the non-legal players on a team. And I think one of the things that happens around the world is that lawyers who are providing information about collaboration really struggle to explain the true value to clients of the non-lawyer members of the team, the financial planners, the communication coaches who are social scientists. But once our clients have actually met the team, and again, it was one of the reasons we set up those meetings, they understand the value for themselves. They've met the individual and they have... Um, a sense of, of that person, of who they are and how well they work together. So our clients know that, pardon me, um, exactly what the process is that they're going to go through. Um, and this process map didn't start this way. We didn't always have a five-step process. We started um, without describing the process in this way. And I think the first time we mapped ourselves, we thought we had about eight steps. But what we've done in formulating this description is to think about the things that we found dissatisfying, that we knew our clients were dissatisfied from in the conventional process. And we don't want to overwhelm clients with all the minor steps that happen under these um, one to five headings. But we want them to understand that there is a clear process, that they're going to be looked after, that the case manager is going to ensure that knitted together are steps one to five, so that clients will at any point know where they are in the process. They'll get communication from the case manager at every step of the process. And the way our pricing works, which often is, is something that people ask about, is that we will give our clients an end to end price and they will pay that along the way. And one of the questions that always comes up is, well, how does Melka manage to collect the fees for the lawyers? And the answer is it doesn't, which is kind of a shame because our dream would have been that there was one single payment by the family or the couple 
and it would be distributed amongst the team. But as we all know, uh, legal practitioners must bill their own client directly for their own work. So we have our regular costs agreements, et cetera, as we would in any other circumstance. Um, and we are not paid by Melka, we are paid directly by our clients, but under that common number. And when the lawyers contract into Melka, that's part of the contractual arrangement, the price that they're coming into the case for. And when we began Melka, I trotted around to the law societies, uh, national, state, I spoke to my insurer, and I couldn't get any help with this idea of running a multidisciplinary practice. And the best that happened in those days, I guess, was that I was told, well, that sounds interesting, that sounds okay, can't quite see anything wrong with that, but anything that goes wrong, don't use my name because I don't really know the answer to this. So in the end, in setting up the process map, in setting up the way we operated, it was really a question of jumping off a cliff and seeing how it went. I think times have changed and we're certainly not the only organisation that's um, involved in what I would call the delivery of legal services in a model outside a conventional legal firm. I also run a legal firm called Smart Separation and it's that organisation under which I hold my practising certificate that enables me to take part in collaborative cases um, with Melka or whomever, it doesn't have to be with Melka. And smart separation also is relatively new. It evolved from Marguerite Picard Family Lawyer, and it is basically a triage and referral service. And somebody asked me the other day, is it an on-ramp for Melka, which it absolutely is not. Smart separation is really about allowing people to have a first look at their situation, to have somebody who's objective, who's not actually ever going to continue working with them, to give them an idea about the referrals they need. What are their process choices? But who else needs to be in their world other than their lawyers? And so I have the backing of a smart circle of different professionals uh, to whom I will refer my clients. And some of them will be the usual ones. It will be about counselling and psychology, financial planning, but also, you know, it can be mortgage broking, real estate agents, um, all, all sorts of different people in that organisation to whom I refer clients so that they can set themselves up to then enter a legal process. But it's not usually where they want to start. And it was from that idea that I created Smart Separation. So basically, Melka has conducted about 500 cases in the last decade or so. Um, I'm, I would describe myself really as a refugee, not just from the court system, but from adversarial negotiation or negotiation that ran the risk of becoming adversarial. So we have a process that works for clients, a process that works for professionals, and a process that I think brings together the best available people to work with clients in a way that allows them to feel secure and supported um, and I think one of my passions has really been to take the, the L or the big L out of law to recognise that when clients are lying awake at night, the only reason that they might be stressing about the law is because they think they need to go to a lawyer and or they think they might end up in the Family Court of Australia somewhere. But when we look at the problems that our clients are presenting with us in a different way from a human-centred design perspective, from a client perspective, and we accept that law is not really what's keeping our clients awake, that's, that was the process and the thinking that led us to design Melka. And because it was begun by a financial planner, a psychologist and a lawyer, we approached it in, I think, a different way. I think we are to this day the only collaborative business anywhere, although there are other collaborative centres where people coalesce around a location and share some costs and so on. But running a business where we can provide this safe envelope for a whole family and do it providing legal services along with the other ancillary services, I think remains unique. So I felt that when I left my law firm, 
it was something of a jumping on the cliff with no safety net. But had I not done that, I was probably going to leave law because I was experiencing so many values clashes in what I was doing. I felt like the promises that I was making to my clients about being able to assist them in some respects rang hollow because I wasn't necessarily able to deliver because I didn't have a choice of who I was working with and so on. And I'm sure lots of other practitioners have had the same thought that when their client comes in to see them, a, a little voice is saying to you in your head, well, I wonder who's on the other side of this and then I'll know how bad it is or how bad it's likely to be or how good it's likely to be. Is this a practitioner with whom I can pick up the phone and we can work something out or is that not going to be the case? And in those days, to be honest, I think it was less the case. We didn't have the drive for people to mediate to think about ways of reaching settlements outside conventional adversarial negotiations. And when I started saying to my clients, I can give you a quote on how difficult this is going to be when I know who else is involved in the case, I thought it was probably time to go find my own herd and to do something different. And so that's what I did. Along the way, of course, we've learned lots of lessons. Um, and one of the things that I would say is, on the one hand, if you can think it, you can do it. But on the other hand, that nothing is as easy as it looks. Um, if you're not lucky enough to have a business brain or a business coach, uh, I was really lucky to partner with people who um, had strengths in that area, then um, it, it can be quite difficult. Um, you need to look out for, for who is there in your court. Um, we didn't anticipate a lot of the criticism that we were going to get. As Terry said, we were early uptakers of different processes and we had a lot of complaints and criticism from within the profession, which was rather surprising to me. But one of the other things I learned partly by being immersed in some of those conflicts myself is that when clients are in any kind of interpersonal conflict, what they really need is to be heard. They're not slavish about whether they're in a process that we have a name for. They want to know what the process looks like. They want to know what's going to be happening. They don't so much, I think, buy into what we're going to call it. They need to understand that somebody's going to be listening to their story and really listening and acting upon it in terms of whatever service is going to be provided to respond to that story. And I think one of the lessons I've learned from Melka is very strongly about the two or the various stories and that any process that you design has to take into account the fact that there are disparate stories in a relationship. And I just wanted to play this little video, um, which is talking about being heard. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop I'll... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. It's what we're asking our clients to do. And it's what we're doing ourselves. So part of my advice for others is to think about the way you practice are you delivering a kind of a templated service or are you trying to adapt to something that works for your clients? So if I had any advice for other practitioners who are thinking about making a change to the way they practice um, is that um, 
get yourself a business coach if you're thinking about creating a new business or if you're thinking about changing the firm you're already in or proffering or suggesting change um, within your business. You, you can manage without all of that external advice, but you'll save time, perhaps years, and certainly a lot of money if you have the right resources supporting you. I think it's also true to say that grit and determination in running a new practice is something that's going to be really important or put another way, persistence is more valuable than genius. Change, I'm saying it is slow, it can be slow. Um, for me, I think there's even less law in family law than I would have thought 10 years ago um, or that I might have dared to express 10 years ago, I suppose, to be put, to put that more accurately. And I think it's up to individual lawyers to show that doing law differently can sit with doing law as you must do law. Uh, it's just that the emphasis in your practice changes. And I think also that we need to be very aware of what our clients' expectations are, setting the expectations to make them more realistic. I think one of the challenges for us as lawyers is the demands that come from our clients. And so learning to be commercial about the setting of those expectations is really important when you are delivering a service, but also being prepared not to take on every client who comes in the door um, to work out whether or not you really are the kind of lawyer that your the, the prospective client wants to see. I think also it's a shame that law schools don't compel all of us to look at some kind of education in human behaviour. I think there are much less important mandated subjects in legal courses than having an understanding of human behaviour. Whether or not we ever work in interpersonal conflict in law, we're always encountering people, um, whether that's the judiciary, the lawyers on the other side of our cases, whether it's our communication with barristers and so on. Um, I do think that I would have benefited greatly from having some understanding about human behaviour all those years ago. But my advice to anyone who's thinking about doing something that seems strange or outside the box is be bold, just do it. Um, once upon a time, I definitely was considered to be an oddball in what I was doing. Now I notice that so many people are doing similar uh, things to me to the point where what I do, I think, is practically considered to be mainstream now. I'm really energised by the fact that around Australia, there are legal practitioners who are finding different ways to do law. Um, and I'm more energised than I can describe really by the fact that so much of that is coming from really young practitioners. And when I left conventional legal practice and started working exclusively in collaboration, that tended to be the, the, the forum of the grey haired people. But I'm really inspired by the fact that much younger practitioners these days have seen the writing on the wall for the system, the writing on the wall for them, for their longevity as practitioners, but also what it means for clients to do things differently. And Terry, you said at the beginning that I had a couple of businesses and um, we have just recently dreamed up a new business which is going to be launched at the end of this month in Sydney. And I guess it's, its genesis came from many years ago for me, thinking about the struggles that I was having as a practitioner working in a system that wasn't working for me before and have closely followed all of the wellness and wellbeing debates um, of whom there are some really stellar advocates in Australia. So we have um, aimed to create a business, well, we have created a business called um, Support for Lawyers. Um, and that website is about to go live. The launch will be at the end of the month. And that's going to be a bespoke or is a bespoke service for psychological and counselling support for lawyers. It's confidential. The practitioners are across all states of Australia and internationally. And it's thinking about all the, the things that affect lawyers, the problems that we have that are specific to law so that people can reach out to somebody who understands what goes on in a law firm and what, what might their needs be. So that will happen in... I think 24 days from now. Um, so I'm really happy to take any questions or um, I'll hand back over to you, Terry. 
Thanks very much, Marguerite. And um, I was going to ask you what's next, but you've already answered that question for me, which is fantastic. And congrats on that. Congrats also on just being an outstanding pioneer in really, you know, holistic service delivery, really, of which legal is, is just a part. But um, really, it's just amazing how ahead of the curve you've been. I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions from kind of the flip side perspectives in a way. And the first one was this, in terms of how you think about your business as well as, well as you've thought about your services and, and now with this amazing exposure to a whole bunch of allied professions and professionals, how's it changed the way that, that you think about the delivery of legal services? And I know you've touched on it, but I wanted to ask that really squarely in terms of how you even conceive, you know, what you do next or where you go with your practice or how you approach clients and maybe all of the above and more. Yeah, well, it's true. It is all of the above and more. And it's fundamentally changed the way I see legal practice. You know, I think the the model, the top-down model of senior partners, um, you know, e equity partnerships and so on, I think they're old models that are going to work for a little bit longer whilst the senior partners remain at the top of the tree. I think we need to start thinking about modelling within law firms what it is we're expecting our clients to be doing. So, you know, we participate in an adversarial legal system which is supposed to resolve disputes. We all know that even though disputes might be resolved on the surface, they're not resolved in any deeper way. And we're really quite incompetent generally as conflict managers and we don't even model that in our own firms. So, you know, lots of work has certainly been done on altering conventional models of legal practice. But in the end, I'd like to see much more sharing of the bottom line, much more genuine engagement with all the people in the firm. And I'm not just talking about the lawyers. I'm talking about incredible admin support staff without whom legal practices couldn't possibly run. And they're the people from, you know, paralegalism to the finance people and whoever else is in your work, law firm helping you to run it. I think there are really terrible power disparities there. And mm. in many ways, legal firms reflect the adversarial system that they are a part of. Mm. So I would like to see that change. And I think if we can start changing ourselves, the way we practice with our individual clients, the way we are in our firms, then that starts to shift some more weight and momentum to changing the whole system. But when I observe that the number of people who've left larger or even medium legal practices and set up boutique practices with their own values or set up solo practices with their own values and people working alone um, or with just one or two other people, I think that says a great deal about what's going on in law firms. And I don't mm. know whether it's to do with a career path being stymied by the weight of numbers ahead of you or whether it's wanting to practice in a way that's truer to your own values. But I think, you know, there's a shake up and a shakedown coming and each individual has to contribute to that. And I couldn't possibly go back and work in a conventional law firm any longer. Nor me, Marguerite. I'm, I'm with you. On, I'm absolutely with you on that one. And, 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 you know, to go to the point that you were making about career paths being stymied, I, I wonder whether they're stymied because folks... Um, weren't the same or thinking the same or operating the same as, you know, a conventional practice. And they're the very people that you need in your practices now, the ones that think differently, right? Mm, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, and, and listening to who it is in your practice and who has ideas. And I think it's very difficult for young practitioners, young partners, young associates, um, young people who aren't, aren't yet uh, on the board um, I think it's difficult for them to be heard because yeah. I think the conventional practice model is still looking at the bottom line and wanting to understand how do we, how does any new idea fit with the single bottom line, whereas mm. I'm much more interested in more than a single bottom line and thinking about how do you reward the people who bring different things to that legal practice? You yeah. know, how do you how do you reward the one who may not bill as many hours but is a wonderful mentor who keeps the... Um, who keeps people connected, who brings the birthday cakes, whatever it is, mm. 
Who are the people in the firm without whom this firm would not be such a great place to work? And are we rewarding those people or are we simply rewarding a particular set of skills and billable hours? And what kind of exportation is happening, happening with young practitioners who, from everything that I understand, despite changed conversations, still seem to be working incredibly long hours, not necessarily doing meaningful work, um, and still being a bit of a cog in the wheel without having true engagement and the client relationships, which I think in the end are the things that is going to continue to make law firms relevant. And I think yeah. Richard Suskind's been saying that for many years. And, you know, I would say Google knows more than any of us. So what is it that we have to offer? And we have to look very differently at the way law firms work, whether that's partnering with our clients, but it's listening to them mm. for sure uh, in ways that I think we don't or we haven't we've done the talking we haven't done the listening absolutely and that's actually the flip side of the question that I wanted to ask you it's a great segue but what differences have you seen in um, I guess client reactions to being able to work within this more holistic environment versus that more conventional model of delivering legal services and products because I know you are obviously as you said very user friendly very user focused very client centric but what have their reactions been to this that you've noticed well probably quite similar to mine in many ways mm -hmm. relief I would I would yeah. say comes first and foremost um, quite often people come to me or to us after they are already been in the litigation system and thought this is not going to work. We've had clients walk out of the foyer of the magistrate's court where an intervention order was in process and say, we can see already what this is going to do to our family, let's run away. Um, we've had, um, I've had many clients come to me and say, look, I've been and seen a lawyer elsewhere and here's the draft of the correspondence that they plan to send to my spouse and I know that's just going to throw a hand grenade into the family. But what people seem to express most relief about is the fact that they can come along on Zoom or in real life um, as a couple. Mm. Many people say, I just want one lawyer. We don't want two lawyers because we know there's going to be conflict and cost. And, of course, I'm saying to them, well, there can't just be one lawyer in collaboration or mediation, or if it's mediation, the lawyer is a, not a lawyer, they're a mediator. Mm. But we can help you to have the kind of conversations that you're looking to have because people will say, we want to stay amicable, and I sometimes have my doubts about what that means, and they say we want to stay out of court, and they genuinely do because they've yeah. heard the horror stories. They know it creates division and conflict, and I think it's such a shame that in adversarial or conventional practice, we polarise people's arguments. We put them into opposite corners of the boxing ring and then we say, now we've got to find a way to build something constructive. Mm. And we've disempowered them from doing that. Mm. Whereas what we're trying to do is to say, um, be supported and empowered and allowed to have conversations, including being allowed to have really difficult conversations about what's going on, um, but being supported in saying, this, this is what I want or need for myself. This is my goal. But I recognise that I'm going to have to make some compromises along the way, but I don't have to be strategic and tactical about that. I can actually be honest about it because this process is about honesty and transparency. So I have daily incredibly positive feedback from clients. That's why I do it. Mm. Of course, it was we designed what we do and I designed smart separation in the hope that this was the kind of um, not just the reaction and feedback from clients, but the kind of experience that they could have. And you've been proven right, by the way. So, yeah, Marguerite, it, it's, it's just always such a delight to spend the time with you and to speak with you. And thank you again. Really, really appreciated your time today and just describing to us your two and now three businesses. Uh, again, very indicative of uh, you being such a thought leader and doer in this space. So really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. And I reciprocate that with the College of Law and the Centre for Legal Innovation, Terry, and um, what wonderful work you have all done. It's an incredible organisation for us to have in Australia. And it's, it's definitely making change. Thank you, Marguerite. Really appreciate that. Folks, I know that, uh, thank you also for attending, and I know that Marguerite is open to you reaching out to her on LinkedIn or obviously through the websites 
um, of her businesses as well. She'd love to hear from you. And we would too. So please feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn, Facebook or Twitter at any time as well. So with all of that said, until next time, again, thank you very much, Marguerite, a pleasure. And thank you again, everyone, for attending. Bye now.